Hey there, I'm Sarah A. Chrisman, the author of the Tales of Chetsumoka, and today I'm going to talk to you about furs. In A Trip and a Tumble, Book 5 of the Tales of Chetsumoka, some of our Chetsumoka friends go up to Canada to meet a family of rich French-Canadian fur magnates, the Delarues. This story allowed me to explore a theme I'd first encountered in an 1891 travel log of an Englishman's visit to Canada, the theme of a posh Indian woman dressed to the nines and virtually shining with an aura of wealth. This real-life anecdote was the inspiration for the fictitious Teresa Delarue. To write Teresa, I had to ask myself the obvious question. How did her family get their money? For a 19th century Canadian family with an Aboriginal background, one of the obvious sources of wealth was the thriving fur trade. The story of fur is, in many ways, the story of humanity and of civilization. People were already wearing furs in prehistoric times. The ancient Scythians and Libyans had garments trimmed in beaver and otter fur, and the ancient Egyptians were already using vegetable dyes to color their furs. Artfully dyed furs may have been a luxury in the hot climate of Egypt, but go much farther north or south, or higher in altitude for that matter, and fur becomes absolutely essential for protecting delicate human bodies from the elements throughout human history. After all, in our natural state, humans are really pretty frail and naked. While fashion may be optional, some sort of clothing is not, unless someone is living pretty darn close to the equator or in a completely climate-controlled environment, and even then they generally still cover some portions of themselves in some way. People have experimented with clothing made out of everything from plant fibers like cotton, flax, and pounded bark, to insect materials like silk, to bird feathers, to shaved fur in the form of wool, and uh, to, to very recently, in the grand scheme of things, petroleum-based plastic textiles like polyester in all its various forms. And yes, so-called fake or faux fur is essentially plastic. No matter how sophisticated textile technology has gotten, though, for thousands of years, real fur has continued to be a prime way to keep warm. Not that it hasn't been controversial. Ever since the medieval era, there have been people eager to point their fingers at other folks and denounce their furs as sinful, although the message of exactly how and why furs are supposed to be sinful has shifted through the ages, and mostly it tells us more about the people pointing their fingers than anything else. To understand medieval condemnation of furs, we have to first understand the concept of sumptuary laws. Simply put, a sumptuary law is a rule stating that people are allowed to have things that are off limits to others. Some people are allowed to have things that are off limits to others. For example, some cultures allow the chief class and or the priest class to eat foods that are taboo for everyone else. Some examples of modern sumptuary laws include the fairly common age restrictions on alcohol consumption. Now back to the medievals and their furs. The medieval era was arguably the most class-conscious and hierarchy-based time in recorded European history. Sumptuary laws fit right into that rigid hierarchy, and there were legal restrictions laying out how someone's rank affected what sort of furs they could wear. A rich merchant might theoretically have enough money to own an ermine fur, but he couldn't legally wear ermine because it, like certain other very exclusive furs, was reserved for royalty. Incidentally, some rather convincing arguments have been made that Cinderella's famous slippers were actually ver, or royal fur, not ver, meaning glass. One of my old French professors in college was rather adamant on this point, but I digress. Peasants in the medieval era had to make do with things like sheepskin and rabbit fur. The idea, of course, was that furs had a hierarchy like everything else in medieval life. Someone who wore a fur above their station was a threat to the status quo and was therefore sinful. Moreover, especially if they were a woman, they'd risk being labeled as guilty of the twin sins of pride and vanity. 
Actually, the language has changed a bit, but this idea of prideful vanity is still the root core of criticisms of fur, even in the 21st century. But back to medieval Europe. At that time, the biggest exporter of furs to Europe, and I do mean biggest, was Russia. Western Europe bought so many furs from Russia that by the end of the medieval era, Europe was getting seriously worried about their trade imbalance, because so much European silver and gold had taken a one-way trip to Russia paying for Russian furs. In light of these concerns, the New World and its huge fur supplies opened up just in time when Columbus landed in 1492. Suddenly, the race was on for all the resources of the Western Hemisphere, and fur was a very valuable and important resource. Furs were virtually ideal as far as trade goods went. The Americas had a lot of them, they were easy to transport, and they had a high resale value back in the Old World. In 1634, a French priest recorded the story of Nalgonquin, who'd shown him a good knife and bragged, quote, The English have no sense. They give us twenty knives like this for one beaver skin, unquote. Over in Europe, the fur was worth substantially more, so both sides felt confident they were each getting the better end of the deal. As recorded histories of the Americas progressed, expansion of the fur trade went hand-in-hand hand with expansion of both America and Canada. Fur was a major resource, just like oil is today. I really can't say that enough. And just as later on, people would start calling petroleum black gold, in the history of the Americas, fur was soft gold. Conflicts over fur-rich territories contributed to the pre-revolution conflicts that Americans call the French and Indian Wars and that other English speakers call the American Theater of the Seven Years' War. Control over fur-rich areas was a major motive for the Louisiana Purchase and westward expansion, and part of Lewis and Clark's mission when they came west with their Corps of Discovery was to scope out what sort of furs were in the newly acquired territory and work out which tribes would be willing to help extract those furs. For a while, there was a conflict between England and the U.S. over whether or not Louis the Louisiana Purchase included my home territory of western Washington state. While the point was still being argued, the British in the area were ordered to try to exterminate every last beaver in western Washington. The idea was that if all the beavers were gone, then the Americans wouldn't want the land anymore. <laughs> the plan didn't work. Actually, the beaver populations in western Washington have rebounded so strongly that now there are issues with beavers in western Washington flooding out roads and even flooding out people's homes. All the same, the fact that the British thought that killing off all the beavers was a plausible way to keep out the Americans underlines the importance of fur to political motives. And then there's Alaska. Long before the 1897 rush for yellow metallic gold in Alaska, and even longer before we knew about or had any desire for Alaska's black gold in the form of petroleum, we really bought Alaska for its soft gold. We wanted the furs. The whales too, but that's another story. Modern discussions of Alaska don't often mention its historic fur and whaling industries, but it's honestly kind of hard to understand Alaska's history without mentioning fur and whales, especially fur. Fur was hugely important to the trade economies of Alaska's indigenous peoples. Russia was in Alaska for the furs for a long time. Japan took furs out of parts of what's now Alaska when Japanese border policies allowed them to. The U.S. got involved in Alaska for the furs, and even Great Britain was taking furs out of Alaska for a while. Anytime that many countries want the same resource that's coming out of the same place, there's going to be conflict. We never actually went to war over Alaskan furs, but the fur card was definitely a big one in the global game of who can get the most resources. While Senate hearings were debating grand questions of geopolitics and fur as both a commodity and a resource that needed to be husbanded, individuals were reveling in the sensuality of fashionable furs. In January of 1894, Cassell's Family Magazine reported, no woman who respects herself, as far as dress is concerned, would, of course, just now ignore the necessity of wearing fur. The magazine went on to describe all the different ways of wearing fur, from fur trim on satin gowns, to sealskin coats so warm and comfortable that they never really go out of fashion, to jackets, capes, tippets, and muffs. A tippet, by the way, is effectively a scarf made out of fur. Possibly the most striking of the fur fashions of the 19th century are the late Victorian fur coats and jackets. 
Advances in sewing machine technology had allowed the making of fur garments which fit like dress bodices, and the results were amazing. When the weather turns cold, as one Victorian trade journal reported, quote, furs are a great comfort, whether from the aesthetic point of view or from the practical. A literary magazine from the late Victorian era reported, quote, the choice furs are something more than useful. They are among the highest forms of luxury, and their disappearance would mean the loss of a unique form of gratification, partly aesthetic, partly sumptuous. Regarded merely as wraps, furs add an exhilaration to the sense of warmth which no other means can give. But the mere touch of the finest furs is a physical pleasure. No woven material, not even velvet, produces such a sense of richness and comfort by mere contact. There is a suggestion of sumptuousness and repose, even in the silence of those deep furs which adapt themselves, without sound and without resistance, to the movement of the wearer. Add to this the beauty of tints and luster, and the wonder is not that the scarce furs cost dearly, but that they should not be more costly than they are. We cannot manufacture a substitute for the choice furs. Unquote. And this is really just as true today as it was back then. Fake fur just doesn't feel the same as the real thing. Seriously, it doesn't. It won't keep you as warm either. Real fur evolved over millions of years for maximum insulation combined with maximum breathability. There's never going to be a synthetic with that level of research and development behind it. Another factor to consider is that fake fur looks pretty shabby after a season or two, whereas real fur garments are often passed down for generations. And do remember, fake fur, like all types of plastic, is made from petroleum. Real fur is a renewable resource. Petroleum is not. But I'll let someone else tackle the ethics of petroleum wars in the modern world. Instead, I'll leave you with another fur enthusiast's quote, this one from the 17th century. Quote, of all the ornaments which luxury has invented, there are none so glorious, so august, and so precious as furs. Unquote. Thank you for watching today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a nice thumbs up and remember to tell your friends about my books. Happy reading!